So this is us at the Muckamore Wool Depot, and it's about 35 miles away, just over an hour's run. And when you get to the depot, the first thing you do is just take your wool, pull it out of the trailer, onto the, gro onto the ground, and then the forklift comes. And in my case, it was taken straight to the grader, so it didn't need to weigh it at that point. And your details are taken, you're logged in with the number of wool bags you have, three bags full. Hello and welcome to Ulster Wool. Thank you for coming with your wool today. We have your receipt of wool, which has a unique document number on it at the top here. And that's what traces your wool through the system. Um, a new wool house improvement that we had um, a few years ago was the wool trace. So every kilogram of your wool is fully traceable from it comes out of your trailer till it leaves the doors at the other side. So your wool today um, is going to get graded straight away. So we don't need to weigh it at intake. We just be doubling up on the work. So it's going to go straight to the grading table after this lot has been finished. So here at the Devo, every single fleece is individually graded by hand. Um, you can see Alan here, our head grader, uh, has been with us a very long time, he's very experienced. Um, what he's doing initially is looking for the colour. Um, how white is it? Are there any contaminants in it? Like VM, which is vegetable matter, which would be straw, any of that kind of stuff, shavings. He's then testing the staple strength to see how strong it is, does it break? and how long it is and that all happens in a millisecond so he's very accomplished at what he does and Alan does this day in day out a lot of people think in the winter we're not busy because obviously you don't really shear your sheep at that time of year but we have targets to hit every day if we can only grade six to eight ton in a day yet we could receive 10 20 ton in a day we're flat out all day every day right through to the end of the season which is the end of April so what is what's the ability of a grader uh, in a ton a day is it? Any no, we would expect both tables to get between them about 68 ton but you see it very much depends on how the wool is presented, how long it takes him to grade it. Yeah. If there's been no effort at all and it's all just dumped into the bag so to speak, that'll stick together and Alan will be grading a handful of wool rather than a fleece. Where so that's could, why you want your fleeces rolled? Yeah, and like if there's no rocket science to it, you'll see just roughly rolled into a ball. I refer to it as lifting a towel off the bathroom floor to shove it in a ball and shove it in the basket. Same rule applies, obviously if you can not take the dags off. And I can see from a distance here that the farmer has taken time with that this, this season, which is really appreciated for, for Alan. And it's also maximising what goes back to that farmer, because that whole fleece is getting graded rather than a handful. Yeah. Well, I would automatically be thinking if you didn't roll it, you would get the grader grumpy, and you wouldn't want that. <laughs> Alan's never grumpy. <laughs> Alan's always delightful. This is our packer machine, and to get one bale, you need anything between five and seven skips or tubs of wool. Um, each skip will have a, a braid code on it, and I'll show you in a wee minute. There's QR codes on there. Um, and they are established by Alan and the other graders at the time of grading. So whenever that wool goes in there, you know exactly whose wool is in it. So here we have grade 649, um, which I think is a Cheviot cross grade. Um, you'll see there's a QR code on that. Once that QR code is scanned at the bailing machine, bailing machine it will trace where that wool came from in terms of, of your paperwork. So these bales behind me have been packed and are ready for auction. For us to sell one grade, we need eight and a half ton of it. Um, to try and put that into some kind of perspective, um, the average clip size for a farmer here is about 360 to 400 kilograms of wool. One of these green bales on average is around 360 to 380 kilograms. And for your clip, for your own wool that you've delivered today, there could be 15 or 20 different grades of wool in there. So you'll have 20 kilos of this, 30 kilos of that, five kilos of this, 37 kilos of that. And we put all of those grades together to get one lot ready for auction. Um, once it gets sold at auction, they then pick it up from here and it goes on to wherever it's going. Now most of the wool, well, well over 50% of it, stays here in the UK and will go into carpets. Um, the price at the minute has been very turbulent. Um, a lot of reasons that I could talk for hours about. Um, but one of the main things was that last year, um, it's economies of scale in this place because we don't buy your wool off you, we sell it on your behalf, we never own your wool. And the cost of everything that we do, that includes here, the other seven grading depots across the way, 
That includes our marketing, our research and development, our sharing training courses, our lobbying on behalf of farmers. All of that is all what's in, they call the handling fee. So the handling fee is here and the cost of the will that it's made at auction is here. And the more will we get in, this goes down, but the less will we get in, the more this goes up. And the volume of wool last year was down two and a half million kilograms, which made this go up. So you should have got 20p a fleece more for your wool last year, but you didn't because the volume of wool was down. On the flip side of that, because I'm always positive, if this had went up, you would have been getting 40p back per fleece. Um, but that's unfortunately how it goes. So th this is all farmer's wool behind me that has been coming in from the first week in May. So apologies if you delivered during Balmore's show, your wool will be the first stuff here um, and the last stuff probably graded by the time we get to April next year. Um, we've had a, a query or a question about the wool quality this year. There's so many different factors that come into play when it talks about the quality of your wool. Number one will be the health of that ewe. How has she been all year? Did she, has she been dosed? Has she been vaccinated? Did she rear three lambs? That's just one bit. Then we have the weather. It's been absolutely awful. Were you lambing indoors or outdoors? Um, the time of year for shearing. Was it sunny and bright and warm? Was there a rise in the wool? Were they trying to hold on to it because it was cold? And they are all factors when it comes to do with your wool at the time of shearing. So obviously the biggest question I get asked, I don't want to say complaint, is um, why is the price of wool so bad? And why am I getting so little for my wool? And it's not for the one to try and. It's very difficult for me here because I've got a foot in both camps. I'm also a sheep farmer, but I also work here. So I know how difficult shearing is. I know how much it costs. I know all of that, but I can also see how hard the marketing team and, and everyone at Ulster Wool works on behalf of you. So that's what they, they do. They market your wool on your behalf. They have um, uh, over 150 licensees now that are specifying your wool and their products. Like that's amazing. That just keeps growing every year. Um, in terms of new uses of wool, really exciting stuff. Um, you maybe seen it on Country File was the Sustainable Rope Company. So this lady here, um, Kate, is actually making rope out of sheep's wool. She's working on new and exciting projects as well over here in Northern Ireland. And I can't wait to tell you about it when you're back next year. Um, and to try and have some faith that there are th good things going on for your will. Um, whenever it gets into a difficult conversation with a farmer, the first thing I'll ask them is when's the last time you or anybody you know actually bought anything made from will? You know, we all wear clothes every day. We all sleep in a bed every night. And is it okay to question what's that made from? What am I sleeping in? Do I have a woolen duvet? Do I have a woolen pillow? Am I wearing any wool? Even from a pair of socks. Like if we all went and bought a pair of socks, then that would create a demand and that would put the price of our, our, our wool up for us. But they're all good debates. Um, and I welcome those questions every day. Um, but sometimes if there's a problem, the answer lies within ourselves. Um, we can go to Tesco's, we can go to Asda, we can get all of our groceries on one side of the aisle. We can get a new outfit new underwear, new bedding on the other, and that's all you know, poly-based oil made products. So how can we think about that? How sustainable is that? It might be cheap and fills a void for a few minutes, but thinking long-term, how does that work in what's supposed to be a sustainable future? Please miss, can I go home now? Now that was us at the wool depot and we're on our way back home so I always spoil my wife and bring her to McKee's farm shop in Newton Ards and as we looked out the window who was working in the yard but pen fencing so I'm going to sneak up on them they don't know I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be video on this. <laughs> this is a video nasty, this one here. Right? Deliveries. Are you boys delivering the goods? That's what I'm saying. Actually, yeah. See you out here. So pen fencing came in here and the tractor flying and knocked the pillar down so they've had to replace it. 
It's Monday the 12th of August and we're out on the field again gathering buck thristles here. There's two or three we missed. Barbara and I did the sweep round right this field away a month or two back but they're always coming up somewhere you have missed one. So there's two or three and they're starting just to seed there now. So this is the time to get them before they seed all over the place. And as the old saying is, one year's weeds is 10 years seeds in every head of that there. Very pretty, but when they're grown in your field with a dozen, it's not so nice. So there you are. There's the seeds blowing away in the wind there. I should have had that lifted a week or two ago. It was one that we'd missed the last time we were around. But anyway, we'll get it now and burn it. Now, way around 30 years ago or so, Barbara and I weren't terribly long married at the time, and that big old house of ours had plenty of rooms, so there was two local farms, and local farms had kept Greenmount students doing their middle year, co middle year out of a three-year course. So they would have stayed with us, the boys, and there was always a lot of fun and nonsense going on. And the two students were always competing with each other on which farm was the better farm and all the rest of it. But anyway, the next uh, farm up the road here, they had cut their lawns, but they also had the mower for mowing the silage out at the front, hosing it down, grazing it up, getting it ready for a couple of weeks away to cut the silage, just getting everything in order. But they had been cutting the lawns and they got the grass cut into the lawn mower and threw it all over and round the, round the, the farm mower. And when the student from the faraway farm was coming down, he saw the grass and he was going back reporting, they've got the mower on, they're at the silage, they're at the silage. <laughs> so I think there was a scramble getting their mower out and going on. So there was always a lot of monkeying around, fooling around. And when the boys would come home tired at night, weary, I would have been up with these buck thistles here and took the heads off and put them in below the sheet in the bed. <laughs> And they should have heard the yellow thing getting in the bed. So I kept my bedroom door locked. So there was always a lot of fun in those early days there. Well, there still is. Now, I forgot to display my Viking Very spreader here. I bought this 10 years ago, I'm sure, and I've never used it. And the other old machine just was on the edge of giving up the shutter for letting this. The fertilizer in and out was jammed and rotted away. So, so this has been lying for ten years. It could do with a lick of paint, but it seems to be a good machine now. I'm just putting a little bit of slurry out in the fields here. It's an absolutely beautiful sky today, blue with the white cloud way up high.
Now there's a strange thing, there's a jet aeroplane and it's come along and all of a sudden you start seeing a vapour trail, then it just totally cuts, there's a gap in it there and then it starts again. Now I know an airline pilot, he lives in America, it's the only thing, but he watches sheep in the shoestring so maybe he could explain that to us. And Put it in the comments, Jim. <laughs> there you are. That's the thistles burn. Not quite, but just about. We've had a lovely wee bit of weather, a nice day or two, and Mullins Farm is out with the combine and getting the crop in while the sun shines. So as they say with the Ulster Scots tongue down here, or the broad spoken fishermen or farmers, if you honey ocht else today, boys, we'll see you next Friday.